Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Bunker Show. Coming to you live and direct from our secret bunker hidden beneath the sewers of Westminster. And we've got a bit of a, a paradigm-shifting show today. Um, we're going to be lifting the veils on some of the uh, deepest, darkest depths of uh, uh, Westminster and some of the, the, the secretive goings-on there. Uh, joining us today in The Bunker, we have our Bunker Show crew, so, first of all, here's the lady with the big silly grin. Here's Helen. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to be here with you all tonight. Um, I'm going to be in the chat room. Any questions you have, any feedback you want to be brought to our guest, I will do my best to get that in for you during the conversation. Looking forward to the show. So, that's just uh, go straight to the Dark City Radio and click on the chat room button and join us in there. And joining us also in the bunker is uh, my wingman, here's Jimmy. Hey, Fabrice, and yeah, this is going to be a really interesting show because you know, I think this topic is actually so, so important for so many reasons. Well, the, the, the topic, one of the topics that we will be covering today with our guest um, is the Westminster paedophile ring. So I'd just like our audience to be aware that uh, some of the subject matter that we could be discussing this evening um, it may provoke a strong reaction. Um, our guest this evening is uh, Political Journalist of the Year in 2012, uh, David Henke. He's a senior reporter with Exaro News. Um, you have their slogan, holding power to account, so that definitely appeals to us in the, in the Bunker Show. He's the uh, author of uh, uh, three books, Marching to the, to the Fault line, which is um, uh, a book detailing the, the miners' strike in the 80s, and uh, two books on, on Tony Blair, uh, The Survivor, Tony Blair and War and Peace, and uh, the recently published Blair Inc., which looks into uh, Tony Blair's activities uh, since he became Prime Minister. Um, so, David Henke, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Oh, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, so, yes, sorry. I was just going to say, how did you um, get started uh, doing what you're doing, and... Um, how did you end up uh, doing what you're doing, where you're doing it? Ah, oh, well, it's a, it is a long story, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> In the sense that I, I, be, I was on The Guardian, actually, for um, it was actually about 30-plus um, years. Um, and basically, I've always had an interest in investigating behind the scenes. And The Guardian, under Peter Preston, this is way back before Alan Rusbridger, took a decision to give me a lobby pass to Parliament, but to tell me not to report the day-to-day -day stuff, but start investigating behind the scenes, which was a really tough number because all the other lobby journalists <laughs> expected me to um, report on the day-to-day -day side and didn't really at the time like the idea of um, digging into um, issues that were going on in Parliament. And basically I got um, three strong stories. One by um, getting very good contacts with the National Audit Office, which actually I realized was an ally for me because they investigated Whitehall and exposed Whitehall when it wasted money and when things went wrong. And I got an amazing break when the old Rover car company was sold to BAE. Um, and because the government had hidden, or um, Parliament had hidden, a memo showing that they had lost, um, they'd basically given them £33 million worth of sweeteners that had never been told. And I got into quite a lot of trouble and was dragged before the Privileges Committee for doing this. But um, at the end, um, we, I was able to stay and no, one re no action was taken against me because they realized they would be pursuing a journalist who would expose um, a cover-up. I then got involved in cash for questions, the scandal of Mohammed El Fayed, um, where we basically discovered that two MPs who, or in fact they were ministers then, but when they were MPs, had taken money 
for um, basically asking questions to help find, which they certainly was against the rules. And that led to the Nolan Committee and a big pressure to improve standards. And then um, I also got involved in investigating Peter Mandelson and finding out he had a secret loan on his house and he had to resign for the first time, but he came back strongly afterwards. So I've had a history of digging into scandals in Westminster. And um, when I actually left The Guardian, um, after a short while, when Exaro News was set up, I got chased up by them um, so that they would have a correspondent. Basically, I would still have a lobby pass because I, I actually switched from The Guardian to Tribune, and I do all the articles for them. Um, and I basically started investigating um, Parliament and Whitehall and then came across what is now turned into the Westminster paedophile ring. And it has a curious um, uh, sort of parallel with Cash for Questions because we actually exposed cash for questions 10 years after it had happened. Actually, no one had noticed the scandal with a lobbying company uh, paying out, uh, by, by, well, they weren't paying out, but actually being used in the center of MPs receiving cash. The paedophile wing actually covers some of the same period, but is only now really being exposed. And basically, it's um, a very... Um, it's very curious because the person who set it off, who came to me, it was just really after I left The Guardian, was not a victim, a survivor, or any of those. He was a concerned local government officer and trade unionist who had discovered a cover-up involving um, the, what became very well known as Elm Guest House, where the police have raided in the 1980s. But he, through uh, various sources, discovered that people living in the same road had spotted, because the, um, basically the survivors wouldn't be necessarily know who they were, but had spotted a cabinet minister by the name of Sir Leon Britton, as it turned out, going in there. And um, basically, that's what started me on, on a very long inquiry, which now involves far more reporters on uh, XRO News than just me, and an editor, Mark Watts, who um, sort of coordinates it all, um, um, into a very long, difficult um, journey. I hope that's not too long-winded. No, I mean, that, that, that explains uh, you know, and gives a great background as well. Why do you think, you mentioned cash for questions and, and it took so long to come to the fore. Um, do you think that, that because of the, the, the nature of those sort of uh, rich, powerful people being involved, that that, that puts a delaying process on, on these things um, being able to be investigated? Yes, I think it did. And also, I mean, Ian Greer Associates at the time, the lobbying company at the center of this, was one of the biggest companies at the time. Um, it went bust afterwards. but And it had all these powerful blue-chip clients from British Airways and, uh, and other, for example, and uh, sort of major, um, major uh, sort of one of the cola companies and all that sort of thing. And basically, no one had looked at it. No, everyone in Parliament was covering the daily day thing, and I hadn't suddenly really realised that these lobbying companies had been set up to influence government, and they were really caused by the um, wave of privatisations, because what had happened was, say, someone like British Airways would rely on Whitehall to help its problems, and then it becomes a commercial competitor working outside. So they suddenly think we need a lobbyist, and this is where Ian Greer um, made, actually, a shed load of money out of it. Um, and nobody really noticed this was going on. And also, we didn't have the checks and balance. The parliamentary register was pleasure to disclose anything. I mean, people, um, I mean, one thing, Neil Hamilton, who still, still denies that he took the cash, he never declared what he had to admit, staying for a week free at Mohammed's uh, Fayyad's hotel in Paris. 
um, because he, he didn't put it on the register. It was very lax. It wasn't um, it was fairly secretive what was going on. And really this blew it, uh, blew it open. And it was because, yes, a lot of the people were powerful. They had connections. I mean, John Major, the Prime Minister, came to Ian Greer's 10th anniversary party. That gives you an idea of how well connected they were. And with those type of investigations, that was actually able to facilitate changes in the in the process, um, in the parliamentary process, the checks and balances, as, as, as you said. So do you think that there's the potential with, um, you mentioned Leon Britton and, and uh, what's, what's become known as the Elm Guest House. Do you think with uh, those investigations and the awareness of, of that potential criminality, um, uh, do, you, do you think it's possible for, for that to progress forward and, and potentially get similar results? Um, I think it is. I mean, we're going to have a huge inquiry, of which I have been uh, both a supporter and a critic of, um, because I would have liked the inquiry that had been set up into the Peter Five to be run as an independent panel. I know people find this strange because they say, well, it hasn't got the power to compel people and so on. But... The thing about that, about the panel, is it would have delved into all these areas quite quietly and then come up with a devastating report. This is what happened. A uh, good example of this is the Hillsborough Inquiry, which um, for years and years they, there was this cover-up of the deaths of people at, um, at Hillsborough. And the um, independent panel delved away, and the net result was their report has been so devastating that we've now got further inquiries and maybe criminal things and so on. The Goddard inquiry, I think, will delve into this, but it seems to me too over-dominated by lawyers and too short on investigators. Um, so I think it will, it will certainly be a powerful committee, but it will also, if they are hearings, it's going to mean that a lot of people uh, are going to challenge a lot of stuff before um, all the information is really available. First of all, you've got to get the information. And the thing about the paedophile network is it's extremely difficult to find out exactly because it's not the sort of thing that people advertise. I mean, I had an interesting chat with a lobby journalist, who, a friend of mine, who basically couldn't believe that MPs were indulging in this sort of thing or, worse, connected to a murder of some of the people involved and said, oh, we would have known. They, 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 we would meet them privately over lunch and other things. Someone would have said. And I suddenly thought, no, no one's going to say that <laughs> if they're involved in a really dodgy paedophile ring. The last thing they're going to do is gossip with a journalist over a lunch <laughs> and reveal that is going on. They're going to be the exact opposite. They're going to try and cover it up with every way they can. Well, one of the, you mentioned the Goddard Inquiry and some of your, your, your uh, issues with it. And uh, in terms of, of uh, the, the lack of investigators, also the lack of, of um, people who've been on the receiving end of, of some of that uh, um, uh, abuse and some of the, the, the stalking and such like that can often accompany it. Um, with... Uh, um, uh, you mentioned, I think, on your on your blog, uh, davidhenke.wordpress.com, um, a group called Reflections UK. Mm. Um, uh, do you think those kind of organisations? Uh, maybe you could explain just a little bit about it and and why why that's come into being. Well, that's come into being because basically the original independent panel that was set up and then disbanded did include uh, a, a couple of survivors, did include sort of a wider range of practitioners and wasn't certainly dominated by lawyers. And then when people pressed for a statutory inquiry, they then took the very strict legal position, which you don't have to do in a non-statutory inquiry. That's the beauty of that. You can be much more flexible and said, we can't have any survivors on that because they're biased, because they've been sexually abused. They couldn't possibly be objective and decide. Although, as someone actually pointed out, you could have hidden survivors if they hadn't disclosed it and technically abusers if they never disclosed it because they wouldn't know. Um, 
So what has happened is there's a lot of survivors have actually taken the view they need a voice to put their case over. And I went to a very moving and very good meeting in Loughborough um, set up by um, a, a survivor who's an author, Jenny Tomlin, and also Esther Baker, who is a, a, a survivor who's decided to go public, um, and actually Phil Lefferty, another campaigner and survivor, um, and they basically want to get together and have their voice heard. And their voice is really important because you've got the feeling, and I thought this was shown up very much by someone like Jenny Tomlin, who's written books, who advises, speaks on this problem. But... Um, Basically, she's been excluded from even sitting on the advisory panel, which doesn't have much power that's been attached to this inquiry. It's not the full, the proper judiciary inquiry, it's just a sign. Um, because she didn't seem to have any qualifications. Well, she actually had a really big qualification. She is a survivor who is articulate and has written books. And it's people like that who are, and I think this is why they decide them, who want to make sure they can put over their case. They can combine together and they can make jolly well sure that they're not ignored because they still, a lot of them are still ignored. I mean, this came up at the meeting one or two, you know, the police say, oh, uh, this is an ancient case. Um, um, we, we've got pressing more things at the moment. We haven't got the time. We haven't got the resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a really important thing that this has happened. And they could be a very, very powerful lobby in, uh, in terms of actually uh, obtaining any form of inquiry um, I, I, I know that uh, I use Twitter quite a lot to ask a number of members of parliament very politely and very uh, respectfully uh, if they would consider uh, joining the request for an overarching inquiry um, uh, going uh, uh, right the way across the board. In fact, I was even able to interview my local MP, uh, Tim Loughton, who was uh, uh, one of the seven original signatories with that. And the number of people who on, on Twitter actually made that uh, jump from seven MPs to you know, mm. 140 plus uh, in a very short amount of time it shows that actually that the, the, the survivors and their supporters uh, are a lobby which are finding their voice. Yes, and that's very important. Actually, I was in at the beginning of that. And frankly, the idea... Um, basically came because um, uh, basically I got together Zach Goldsmith the Conservative MP for Richmond which his constituency included the site of the Elm Guest House who frankly is exceedingly concerned about cover-ups and other things in the past um, decided to um, get together what was an all-party um, group of MPs and this was actually crucial what he wanted to make sure was that child sexual abuse of any sort was taken out of um, party politics because it's not that, I mean for a start um, the, the abusers are not all Tories and they're not all Labour and they're not all whatever um, so he got together and he got the Greens as well, Caroline Lucas, and all because of his Green connection. He got Tim Lawton, interested, who was the children's minister, who was very concerned that not enough had been done to protect people and had been really frustrated, from what I gather, in government in trying to get the government to take the issue seriously. Uh, with Tom Watson, with Simon Danzig, <laughs> Um, and a very, um, and also um, Tessa Munt, who was, um, that was really, which was really extraordinary. She actually, as uh, Vince Cable's uh, bag carrier, what we call, which is really parliamentary private sector, had a good knowledge of Whitehall. And not only did I give them a breakdown of roughly where we were, they suddenly said, well, we've got to write a letter to the Home Secretary, Theresa May. And they looked at me and said, you don't mind drafting it? And I thought, my God, if Theresa May thought some dodgy journalist was drafting something to my, in their name. But actually, I did. And she was brilliant because she actually dra changed, she said the letter was okay, but she changed the paragraphs in it so the civil service had to reply to every single point and couldn't dismiss it easily. So they got together and they um, basically... Um, 
became an all-party issue. And I think once it had started, it started to spread because they, people looked at it and thought, well, actually, normally um, you wouldn't expect, I mean, even within the Labour Party, Tom Watson and Simon Danzig are on different wings of the Labour Party, um, you know, and uh, uh, sort of, and the Tories have described, I mean, Zach, and Zach Goldsmith really described himself as a maverick Tory, so I'm not really a Tory, and it's going to be quite interesting when he stands for the London mayor, but that's another story. <laughs> Yeah, hi, hi, David. It's uh, Jimmy here. Now, uh, uh, it was interesting you brought up um, Tim Lawton earlier because um, recently there was a, an amendment um, uh, uh, to uh, the, the the Secrets Act um, proposed by John Mann, mm-hmm. and um, it's interesting because Tim Lawton didn't actually um, didn't actually vote. Mm. For the bill, you know, like he 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 wasn't amongst one of the seven mm. Tories who who actually abstained, uh, who won who won against the whip. Um, mm. What what do you think about the John Mann bill? Well, I mean, I think John Mann is quite right to try and say actually one should, um, um, you know, the, I guess John Mann is basically wanting to make absolutely clear that the security services can't um, cover anything up. Um, the um, uh, the interesting thing was. But this issue was whipped, which is the parliamentary thing where MPs are told by their side which way to vote. And the government obviously didn't want it. So it's fascinating. I think Zach Goldsmith did vote for it because if he was following the... But quite a lot of uh, MPs just towed what was the party line. And John Mann is quite an interesting character because he he is, is also in his own way a maverick and therefore you get these internal jealousies and other things, and people don't concentrate on the issue. They concentrate on the personality of the guy, I'm afraid, I suppose like lots of people in institutions do, uh, rather than following the, um, you know, the whole, um, whole issue. So I think, I think that is what happened. Um, and it's a shame, really, you didn't follow Zach Goldsmith's uh, view. But, uh, yeah, it it, mm. it, it, it's interesting in, in that way when uh, it seems that... Uh, uh, the Westminster machine lines up and plays the man rather than the the, the question the man is standing on. Uh, in this case, John Mann, because the questions that he he does put forward, when you have police officers and uh, security service, army officials, civil servants bound by the Official Secrets Act, these are people that we've trusted for our protection. The Official Secrets Act has, has never been... Uh, mentioned in Parliament as uh, uh, a piece of legislation to to um, to be related to uh, child abuse, mm. um, and so it's 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 interesting to see um, that if this conversation is pursued uh, in the public forum, uh, you know, much further. Um, I've, uh, it's very very difficult, I, I think, for um, the intelligence services. To um, to not be forthcoming or to require any exclusions in it. Oh, David, I've I've got another question for you because um, this re- this is in regards to um, Radio 4's any questions um, around about the same time that the, the John Mann proposal was um, being being placed, and um, Teresa Munt, uh, Tessa Munt um, mm-hmm. was appearing, and she basically made um, mention of um, John Mann's proposed amendment to the Serious Crime Bill, mm-hmm. but she also said that it was never voted upon for some reason. Um, now that goes against um, that goes against her her actual what she knows to be true. So, do you have any view on that? Well, well, because it was voted, wasn't it? So I don't quite know why. Um, uh, I mean, another clever tactic in Parliament is to try and avoid a vote sometimes on something, actually. I mean, but, um, I mean, I, again, it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for her because I did not know when I first met her that she was herself a victim of child sexual abuse. This only came out later in a Commons debate. And um, I certainly know that she, as far as issues she she took up when she was an MP, she was very determined to get something done. And they were, and if she wasn't satisfied, um, there was a call to Theresa May. And Theresa May, actually, to her credit, would see her. And um, and actually, um, one I mean, I was supposed to say, but one thing I am I'm not a as you might expect as as a centre left 
person or a left, certainly left person. I am not um, passionate about a lot of the things um, Theresa May is doing in other areas. But on the child sex abuse thing, I think she has played a blinder by, although she's been mucked about with you know the choice of chairman, I suspect that may have been a bit of shenanigans in Whitehall. When I look very carefully on what Theresa May was saying uh, to people who were pressing for this inquiry and what David Cameron was saying, there was a really big subtle difference because Cameron was more or less ruling it out. I think Cameron was panicking that, my God, all sorts of terrible things are going to come out. They're going to affect the Tory party in uh, general because of the prominent nature of people um, who were going to be investigated. Um, Theresa May um, made it rather clear before even there was inquiry that she was minded to do something on this, and she used the line, oh, well, until the police have finished investigating. And um, frankly, um, the police, um, and that was a rather lame thing, because the police will always be investigating some form of child signal, but nevertheless, she made a quite a different, uh, different start. And then she went ahead with inquiry when Cameron panicked, actually, uh, at one weekend, I'm told. Cameron actually panicked because the Independent ran the story that uh, uh, Gazzaro did, they have saying that Leon Britton faced a sort of a, a rape thing. And that panicked, well, I'm told from a really good source who was talking to someone in number 10, that actually uh, there was a complete panic. And suddenly Cameron did a sort of, total U-turn spin in all directions. They've got we must have inquiry immediately. Then they rushed into it and didn't check all the people they were pointing to it, which was um, a tragedy, actually. But, um, sorry, I'm going round. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, somebody in, in David Cameron's position, you know, could be uh, panicking because um, there are some very serious um, questions mm. that in and amongst... Um, uh, all the shock and surprise at some of the people who are involved. Um, Jimmy Savile uh, was uh, uh, doing favours for the Prince of Wales, the next in line to the throne. He was um, uh, dinner, dining with the Thatchers on a regular basis. Um, Cyril Smith was uh, in a very senior position. He was chief whip of the, the Liberal Party for a number of years. Um, Peter Heyman, who uh, obviously Richard Kerr uh, know, knows a lot about, is an incredibly influential figure being a deputy director of MI6. How these people got into those positions and the, the bodies that are supposed to be uh, looking after the establishment, whether it be special branch, the security services, um, or, or other areas of the, the police and civil service, um, either they miss them, so they're not fit for purpose, or they were complicit to some degree or another, which also makes them not fit for purpose. Mm. And those are some of the very, very difficult questions that obviously with, with, with the bravery of people like Richard Kerr coming forward, um, uh, uh, that are becoming more, more and more persistent. So, you know, what do you think the, the, the gravity of questions like that is, is going to do as the inquiry, as it seems now, will move forward? Well, they're going to have to tackle this because there is one... I mean, I've, I've sort of thought about this quite a lot as I kept digging into bits. And two things struck me, actually, about this. One, some of the people who we now know uh, were paedophiles, like uh, Cyril Smith and others, um, um, basically escaped prosecution. And you think you tend to think, well, why? And if you look very carefully, you'll find that various sort of nasty criminal elements, uh, who are real criminals, are in jail. Sidney Cook is a good example. He's in jail for nasty, vicious behaviour. And you almost wonder, well, why didn't it go a bit further when they now admit 
there's evidence. I mean, after all, the police have said that Cyril Smith, I mean, that's the police itself now, visited um, Elm Guest House. And they were, and there's also been the huge scandal in Rochdale with the, um, you know, the, uh, to the school there. Why didn't this, didn't someone come and start arresting them? And my suspicion is now that the reason why they didn't is because once you start clawing at people like Sir Cyril Smith and arresting them and charging them, um, you're going to basically start getting nearer the most highly, the VIP ones at the potential top. And I'm wondering whether these people were protected and there was a, a deliberate attempt to not pursue this because people at the top knew this was happening and some were implicated in it as well. Um, and they made sure that they didn't want the whole house of cards coming down. And the thing that Goddard has got to do is to bring the whole house of cards down. Well, do you think it might be, you know, that the... Uh the, the cutting edge, the dialogue may even be a, a step further than that. When, uh, for example, Cyril Smith, uh, the first complaints were made about him when he was just a, a town councillor. So uh, do you think that there's a potential for intelligence agencies to keep their leverage over people, even if they're not senior at that time, mm. and maybe even uh, promote their career knowing that they have somebody who, with that kind of information on them, is going to do whatever you ask, in the words of Tim Fortescue, you know, the, 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 the chief whip. So do you think that there may be a, a policy? I mean, this is, this is um, you know, Richard Kerr also uh, was at Kinkora, where it seems that there may have been a policy to use the abuse of children um, as a political leverage tool and as um, uh, uh, currency for the intelligence services? I think this is um, quite likely because if you think um, you're running the security service and if you take the view that Sir Leon Britton appears to be, there seems to be evidence involved in paedophile activity and you know, and he's the Home Secretary, you can jolly well know as far as your organisation is concerned that he, if it, I'm talking about the intelligence service and so on, that if you want budgets and other sort of things, and the police as well at the top, um, and you've got someone that you've got evidence about the way they've um, transgressed, you've got the whip hand because, frankly, they're going to have to agree to it because they wouldn't agree to what you want done because... <laughs> Otherwise, they could be thrown to the wolves. I mean, and the way it would be done, I would imagine that they would take some major um, tabloid newspaper or major one and leak some information that was verifiable. And um, then stories would start appearing. And in fact, I mean, it's a, quite a standard practice. I mean, lobby journalists are used a bit, but it's more investigative ones uh, that, that, that are in that, that on the nationals. Um, so I think the mere threat of that is enough to um, actually give someone a whip hand. And, and I haven't got enough yet evidence, but I've got a sort of the one or two people who are pointing to the fact that quite a lot of time seems to have spent monitoring these people, but it was only monitoring. They didn't do anything more. Uh, and why? And then you ask, why did they do this? And they said, this was going to be rather useful to some people. Um, so I think there is there is an element in this. I don't think it was a sort of whole organised British conspiracy, you know, with all worked out. Uh, mm. I mean, I've been told that the paedophile things are more like a series of concentric rings that join up together, like the Olympic <laughs> symbol, you know, that they're yeah, things in. Yeah. And, and it's not a, uh, a sort of one, there wasn't one thing, but there is some suggestion that the whole sort of nasty VIP thing did indeed begin in Concora and then spread around the country, going north Wales, down to Brighton, down to cross London, and going north the other way, actually, ending up in Scotland. But it may have been a loose group of individuals who know each other and found places. I mean, one of the things we did, we did notice in... Um, we got hold of one of the 
Tory um, early on in the Elm Guest House business of a, um, a basically it was a leaflet for partly a, a sort of a, 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 a sorry a sort of magazine that base carried. I mean, this has been one of the problems of this. this game. Carried stuff about the campaign for homosexual re- equality. As you remember, at the time, um, being gay was was it could be um, career damaging for uh, a member of parliament or mm. any other one. Mixed up with a nice sort of um, advertisement for Elm Guesthouse and how to get there from Wales or you know near the M4, <laughs> M25, etc. Uh, and so they obviously were loose groups who who were who were doing this and actually. I found this one of the most difficult investigations I've ever done in my life because one has to differentiate, I mean, and even in places like Elm Guest House, between what would be regarded today as you wouldn't take a second look, i.e. two consenting adults, so, you know, meeting and are gay and that is perfectly okay with a paedophile network uh, that was uh, the, the, where it is not okay. And what appears to have happened in the 80s, from what I can tell, and it certainly shows up in North Wales and it shows up in our own guest house, is the two, because there was a general panic, you know, general being homosexual was not regarded as, um, uh, you know, it was, as I say, it, was, it could be career damaging and you could be exposed um, and even open to blackmail. Um, the two things got conflated together and you've got to disentangle who are the pedos and who are actually, um, what shall I use the word, perfectly respectable gay people. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that, that is one of the, the, the issues that are there in, you know, in terms of, you know, how hard it is to tell whether somebody's being blackmailed or whether somebody is actually, you know, a perpetrator of abuse. Yeah. Or even as we were referring to the Official Secrets Act, if they're actually there for uh, another reason, if, if security services are monitoring people or as, you know, uh, um, I think Richard Kerr alluded to, you know, that uh, security services and police can move people from one place to another. They can mm. make sure people don't ask questions at the appropriate time. And you also mentioned, uh, I think, some of the publications as well mm. and uh, the advertisements that, that, that were in the Elm Guest House or, or for the Elm mm. Guest House. And one of the things that, that kind of jumped out at me there was um, the, the the coded language that was used for uh, the the Spartacus network, mm. um, which is it, it seems like a coded uh, way in the uh, uh, homosexual community of of, of uh, differentiating between um, paedophilia. Yes, and that is quite an interesting thing because it would have probably been essential at that time because both both groups may have well been underground. Actually, if you see what yeah, I mean. well, both both <laughs> groups, you know, socially at that time, if you're a, a homosexual man, um, you would you would wish to be discreet if you had a a, a career to think about. Um, That's and so, right. Yeah. Um, now, did. did do you think that uh, with with some of those sort of coded words uh, in that way, or some of those coded networks, that that those might have been, you know, some of the ways in which um, the intelligence agencies, you know, with uh, the paedophile information exchange and uh, Sir Peter Wrighton, um, uh, and I think Pete, uh, Peter Heyman's involvement with that. So do you think the intelligence agencies could have been linked in with, with, with those, and that's why some of the, the people involved with those wouldn't have been investigated? I think that was very likely because actually the problem was with the security service, as far as I could see, that it certainly had closet gays like Morris Oldfield, but are now thought to be um, um, paedophiles as well, or allegedly um, by uh, people. And what is also happening, I mean, I'm, I obviously would want to protect all sources who've come to x or to me or both, um, but what is coming out, and actually the crucial, I would say, the crux of 
what is going on is actually in Operation Midland at the moment and whether it's linked to and the fact that the homicide and murder squad of Scotland Yard are involved. And, um, could could the, you tell us a little bit about Operation Midland for the people who, who no, might not sorry, be familiar yeah. with it? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, Operation Midland basically is the investigation into Dolphin Square and other properties in London that may have been um, used by um, uh, MPs, ministers, people from the security services and other people there. And basically they have a one a source who is a survivor who the police regard as a basically sound and this is often a problem. I mean, I won't diverse by too much, but saying one of the problems in this area is I, I like to get investigations from people who aren't survivors as well as survivors because some survivors can be really badly damaged. It's obvious it happened to them and everything else, but in actually trying to stand up and sort out the information is really, really difficult. This particular source, however, who never came forward at any time before has actually um, been, um, as far as the police are concerned, providing them with very useful and detailed information, which is why this they've called in the murder, because they are looking at whether actually some of the um, survivors were actually uh, killed or murdered um, and in, in some way or another. And that the police, I do know, are taking very, very, very seriously. And, um, and that, I think, is going to be one of the biggest shocks for the, um, shall we say, the British establishment, if they actually can um, um, sort of uh, basically produce a case but, uh, for what has happened and who was involved. And mm. they wouldn't be wasting their time on it to such an extent if it wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, and in, 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 in terms of, of people who've um, uh, who survived, in terms of people who haven't survived as well, I mean, there's a number of, uh, you know, things that in, in hindsight would be, would be good to cover off. I mean, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, people like Sir Peter Wrighton, who mm -hmm. was um, convicted of having obscene materials and then uh, resided in the Henneke Major estate, mm -hmm. Um, do you know if anybody has, has searched uh, the, the, the major estate to see if there is any, any evidence there, for example? I'm, I'm not certain, actually, if they have. I do know the police do tend to, once they've started something, to actually do um, get uh, search warrants and so on. But I, I think I might be getting too near to operational <laughs> explanations, actually, and I don't want to damage yeah. any investigation. Yeah. I'm sorry, I to mean, be, but I, I think I want to be careful about what, yeah, because I'm, obviously there might be people who would love to know exactly what they may have got or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you mentioned also some of the difficulties that, that survivors have coming forward, mm. uh, and that can often be because of the um, you know, ab abuse they've, they've, they've received. Mm. Sometimes they're, they're, they're drugged or they're applied with, with other substances. And you know, the, the impression I get is that a great amount of control and threat is, is used with these, these mm. children. And sometimes um, they're they're commodified, they're turned into a, a, a currency um, you know, in terms of, of what Richard Kerr has come forward mm -hmm. and, and mentioned about uh, um, uh, some of the way in which he was in, encouraged to behave and, and, and make money and survive. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, uh, that the public needs more of an understanding of, of, of that and um, do you think that uh, people are getting better at, at listening to those people and making them feel secure? People are getting better and it is a very difficult I think actually the thing that the real catalyst outside all this was the Savile business because, and because of his connections and everything else and I, I, I would think the report when it finally comes out there is an investigation or BBC uh, is probably going to be quite um, damning um, uh, but the result the good result of this is that survivors are now being listened to 
when they were normally dismissed and there were there and there was a group of lawyers who probably specialized in defending pedophiles and generally the defense would be if there was any case for pedophile accused oh well they're only there to make money from these people they are you know they're unreliable because they've taken drugs and they, even if the pedophiles <laughs> had actually plied them with drugs in the first place um and sort of so they were worried about all this but i mean i think the thing and it's it's, it's, it's a good time to say this is that some who've become public like esther baker is i am i am from my chats with her is being seriously listened to by Staffordshire Police. And in fact, we saw the fruits today with the first arrest in Ling. Now, there's nothing to do so far. There doesn't seem to be massive connections to Westminster. There seems to be a, a ring that specialised in young girls in um, around the area. But I think that would not have happened, um, um, you know, um, five... Uh, 10 years ago at all and the police are trying I mean, as far as I can see in the different and the police forces are being a bit overwhelmed by the number of cases they've got to look at and also it, I think it's shown up by um, the fact that where the police have revisited and I must well use the example of um, Elm Guest House where the police revisited and I still, still think there's more work to be done on this the Elm Guest House and looked into it all, they discovered, to their horror, really, and it was sad that the man died, uh, frankly, for the case of justice, um, that the man who ran the Grafton uh, you know, Road um, children's home was a paedophile. And he was the very man that, when they raided Elm Guest House, they had him tipped off because they thought the children would need protection, not knowing they were tipping off for a but well, at least a Roman Catholic priest who worked with him and it appears to have a long history of paedophilia and trip, is actually now in jail. And all this, uh, the reason why I think this is happening is because the police did listen to the witnesses from this, whereas, from what I can gather in 1984 or when it was re-raised again, they never... You know, they they pretended to be dismissed, uh, and when there was one case, the actual council, which from council, paid off the person when they realised there was some evidence that, that this person may have been a, uh, been molested, and that I don't think you can do that very easily now. So to, you, there's the, you know, with the change in attitude that has happened over the past few years, um, and people being uh, listened to uh, in, a, in a more complete way. Um, do you think that uh, if, um, if people uh, have experience with somebody who was a, uh, um, a person in a position of authority or even a, a powerful person, that, uh, that, uh, that they can, can come forward now and be received in a, a, uh, a different, different way. I mean, I know you at Xaro uh, take very, very seriously uh, people's, people's ability to uh, contact, contact you anonymously. anonymously. Would you like yeah. to be able to uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we take this incredibly seriously. I mean, both, both about having a drop box and a sort of protective thing. And I also do on my own website, I've got to contact me and I find that people approach me um, privately as well. And we always ensure, unless the person thinks otherwise, that they are, everything is treated in confidence. And then we spend quite well, in a very large amount of time, because it involves different reporters, in digging into what, um, you know, trying to stand up the information, finding other things. I mean, for instance, and sometimes not from other survivors. I mean, if you get a venue, for example, that you discover the survivor is saying, well, this isn't that, happened there. And then you can get a police contact who says, oh, yes, we were watching this. You suddenly realize, oh, well, the information they've given us about this place stands, stands up from two different sources. And it's very important in an investigation, and it's a difficult thing to do, particularly in this area, is to actually be able to get independent sources, people, you know, people who don't know each other, 
uh, able to tell you some uh, um, sort of similar information because that makes it much, much more credible and gives a sort of uh, chance. And we actually take our time over things as well. I mean, we don't rush in and, I mean, we're not after a cheap headline, um, you know, by rushing something that we've heard overnight into uh, papers. It rather needs a, a, a lot of time to dig into and find out what to write. And we also try and work with them. I and mean, we do, I mean, a lot, a lot of the staff do take calls from distressed survivors and have a chat with them when they're feeling down and so on but uh, i mean we're not qualified to do this we're only journalists but at least it helps them and we try and feel what one should have a duty of care uh, even though you haven't got a statute of care to people to you know basically uh, uh, look after them in a way or help them get through things because we i realize i mean more i mean i think it's the most heinous thing apart from probably i don't know um someone who is severely injured and traumatized say in a war situation and of ruin um the what they've gone through is about you know destroys lives for years afterwards and has an equivalent problem there so the people actually i mean the experience is i mean it's a really it's a really difficult thing in fact one can only take so much of it oneself even reporting it if you know what i mean because it is really it's really traumatic and actually so therefore i tend to feel these people must be uh, you know, well protected and helped, actually. And also, they must get justice in the end. They must absolutely... And, and, and contrary to what the lawyers for paedophiles often say, they're not actually after the money. They're after someone to believe them, saying it's happened. And also, if the victim's still alive, sorry, if the perpetrator's still alive, that they actually are put behind bars. And that is, for a lot of them, is... Um, uh, what they really want their yeah, major peace of mind, mind to be able yeah. to to be able yeah, to do that, do that. and uh, uh, with, with um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry if we're, we're, we're echoing, echoing as we're coming, coming through, through. Mm. no you're all right <laughs> um, actually I hope I'm not echoing anyway. uh, but so, so you know witnesses, uh, witnesses can, can go, go to, to a local, local uh, uh, internet uh, cafe and, and they can make up an email address so that um Mm, yeah, and they don't have. We don't use their real names. And in fact, we had a we had a we had a name when we do a story that we we use a different name. And it's only if they decide. I mean, Esther Baker took a decision to go public, but it was her decision. She wasn't being pressurized. I don't think she was even being pressurized by other media to go public in the, in the sense of where her real name was. Um, uh, but all the others are all under you know um, different names. <laughs> Actually, that they're not their real names. Actually, if they're written about them publicly. So, how yeah, can people get get, get, get hold of, of uh, your, your your Dropbox? Drop and um, um, as we're, we're moving into the home stretch of the show, yeah, how can yeah, they, they, they 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 catch the work of Xaro and, and yourself? yourself. Well, basically, they can catch the work of Zara. We're getting onto the website and, and finding the Dropbox. And similarly on my site as well, actually. Um, and um, uh, you can, I've got to contact me a bit. And actually, it comes through to my private email. I then look at it. They can leave a number. Um, they can leave uh, an email address. And I then start getting in contact with them. And I, and, and, and I always tell them, very beginning and what they're telling me you know they needn't worry i'm not going to be quoting them or anything like that okay. uh, thank so you very much, much indeed david, david. Um, um i think, I think we're, 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 we're moving towards, towards the end, end of the show, the show so. so yeah i just, yeah, I just want to say thanks, thanks ever so, so much for your work, work david, david. Um, so we've got, so we've got, got a bit of an echo going, going on yeah but i just want to say you know really heartfelt thanks for helping as many survivors as you can and well we do our best hard work thank you very much indeed thank yeah, and it's it is a worthy thing to try and do. I think anyway <laughs> to get this 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 sorted. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, like, know I'd, I'd like to say, say thank you too, David. It's brilliant. brilliant. You know, like, it's great like having guys like, like you out there and, and, and um, organisations like Xara and um, um, about when, when you have a prime minister who calls victims uh, conspiracy theorists. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd also like, like to remind everybody out there about, about your book, Blair Inc., in, which uh, yeah, seems like it'll be a, yeah. a very, very enlightening and informative read. Really I'm going to uh, track, track myself, myself down, down a copy of that pretty soon. Um, um, 
Also, also tomorrow, tomorrow, if anybody is in Chelmsford area, area Chris Spivey is during court at 10 a.m. tomorrow at Chelmsford Magistrates Court. So, so if, if anybody, anybody can, uh, is in that area, he can lend him some support and uh, see if he gets justice. They're trying, They're trying to, to uh, uh, deny, deny him the right, right to uh, uh, question his witnesses, his witnesses and the witnesses against him, against which is, isn't is really British justice. justice. Um, also, also, we've, we've got, got a great, great evening, evening coming, coming for you on Dark City Radio. Radio. We've got, we've got the Cannabis Compassion Club, Club with Martin Edwards, Sarah, Sarah and Bob. Uh, uh, we've got Jason, who is guest, who's, guest, who's, who's the chief executive of LEAP, which is Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, and and uh, he, he's, a, he's a, sorry, Jason's Jason is also, also the producer of the documentary The Culture High, High uh, which is a documentary about, about the, Gulf, uh, uh, the drug, drug war, war, which is well, well worth catching. catching. After, After that, that at nine, nine is the Matt Steele show, show with uh, uh, Vinnie Eastwood, Eastwood. So, so that'll, that'll be a cracker, as Vinnie's always worth catching. We'll be back next week with some more from the bunker. Yeah, look forward to seeing you all next week. And yeah, yeah. Good night from the bunker. Good night, Good night everybody, everybody, and thanks, and thanks to the Dark City Group for uh, hosting our show tonight. Really enjoyed it. Very interesting. interesting.